The COVID-19 pandemic has made us more aware of our surroundings, specifically how viruses and diseases spread so easily. Some of us have become more careful about sharing food or drinks to others to avoid any kind of infection transmission. Today, we'll learn more about two infectious diseases that can spread via saliva-related transmission or droplet transmission infectious mononucleosis or mono, and a virus called mumps. I'm Dr. Freddy Gomez and this is MedTalk Health Talk on CNN Philippines. Today, we'll discuss two specific infectious diseases and how they spread and how to treat them. With us is Dr. Nicole Pereras Grande. She is a pediatric infectious disease specialist at the Makati Medical Center and Asian Hospital and Medical Center. Also with us is Dr. Cesar Matthew Madria. He's a family medicine physician at the Cagayan Valley Medical Center. Let's focus on what mono is. Dr. Nicole, can you please tell us what mono is and what causes mono? So I guess if you were a fan of teenage movies or teen movies, you'd hear about this primarily because it's spread via saliva. So a patient with mono would have fever, a sore throat, and swollen lymph nodes. So there's also some form of fatigue. So this was quite popular because it got focused a lot of teenage movies or series. Now, Dr. Matt, is there one part of the body where infectious mononucleosis really shines, really shows its effects? For infectious mononucleosis, the typical symptoms of this disease usually appear for, appear for to six weeks after being infected with your Epstein-Barr virus. So the first symptom is the feeling of malaise that is followed by the triad. Usually the first is the fever that reaches 39 to 40 degrees Celsius in the afternoon or early in the evening. Secondly is the sore throat that is with the pus-like material in the back of the throat and the enlarged lymph nodes are profoundly in the neck. Some of the symptoms that Dr. Matt mentioned of infectious mononucleosis, we also see that if we have the flu, maybe if we have uh, some other sickness, what can stand out with if infectious mononucleosis? What is something that may prompt a physician like yourself to, 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 to think that this could be infectious mononucleosis? It zeroes in on the young adult and teenage group, 15 to 24 years old more or less, because the younger age group, usually they don't have symptoms, so it goes unnoticed. And one prominent thing about mono is the fatigue that comes with it. If you as a physician would do a basic CBC, you would see a distinct part of the blood count, which are the monocytes, would increase and the white counts would also be high. So that would kind of differentiate it from other symptoms, a triad. So there's fever, there's sore throat, prominent lymphadenopathy or swollen lymph nodes, mm -hmm. and certain things you would see in the blood count. Mono is notoriously known as the kissing disease. Could you explain why it got this name? And apart from kissing, are there any other ways that uh, infectious mononucleosis can be transmitted? Well, it probably gained some uh, sort of pop culture connotation because it would be featured on some shows as you'd get the disease after a makeout session because of uh, saliva transmission. But actually, there have been studies. There are very small risks of passing it on via organ transplant or via breastfeeding, but very, very minimal chance. Majority is really from saliva transmission. If someone gets infectious mononucleosis, can they get it again or do they form antibodies for this? Well, they tend to shed over time, you know, even when they're already well. There have been noted uh, episodes still of viral shedding over many months after. But I think what tends to worry people are the complications of mono, though rare. Um, that's why we kind of tell our patients they cannot engage in contact sports or very intense physical activity for about three weeks to four weeks after because there's a risk of splenic rupture. So one of the internal organs, which is the spleen, tends to be affected when it comes to mono. Dr. Matt, when it comes to infectious mononucleosis, ano pang ibang mga sakit ang pwedeng mapagkama lang? Ibang sakit pero infectious mononucleosis pala. There is this uh, wrong connotation uh, most of the time that uh, infectious mononucleosis is similar with mumps because mumps already has this uh, signs and symptoms also of your fever, easy fatigability, and enlargement of the lymph nodes. So that could be also one of the probable uh, diseases. How about 
tonsillitis, which is common with us Filipinos, or maybe strep throat infection, can these be misconstrued as those disease entities, yung pala infectious mononucleosis pala? Do they share similar traits? They can have this the same time infection with your um, your sore throat that is uh, caused by bacteria. So uh, that's possible na magsabay sila. They could uh, appear together. Okay. Now, Dr. Nicole, uh, the important question now is the proper diagnosis. How is one properly diagnosed to have infectious mononucleosis? Sometimes a clue for us physicians is yung mga pasyente natin, di ba, pag may sore throat, binibigyan natin ng amoxicillin or ampicillin. May, um, may porsyento po na they get a rash. Uh, uh, it's called the morbilliform rash or a non-specific rash that tends to after giving these antibiotics. So some of the time, we would ask for specific lab tests, not just a basic blood count, to help us with the diagnosis. But this tends to self-resolve really, and it's very rare that we would need to give steroids for treatment of mono. Now, Dr. Nicole, people with infectious mono, do they get well on their own uh, kahit walang uh, tinitake na gamot? Most of the time, Dr. Freddy, hindi kailangan talaga ng uh, medicine. You know, they get well by themselves. But if they have certain complications, for example, if your tonsils are so swollen that it makes it hard to breathe or there's some sort of airway obstruction or you would have other complications like swelling of the heart muscle, sometimes we give steroids for a week or so and that will help resolve symptoms. But majority of the time, they get well po on their own. For those who are recovering at home, they were diagnosed with infectious mononucleosis. What are good things to have at home that can uh, sort of help with the symptoms ng infectious mono? First, they need to get plenty of rest. And also, they need to be hydrated, so they need to drink water most of the time. They can take a paracetamol for fever and pains, but avoid aspirin for children and you know, teenagers to prevent damage to the liver or brain, or what we call the Rye syndrome. When we come back, we'll discuss who are at risk of developing another infectious disease called mumps. We'll learn about this condition and its complications to our health. All me here on MedTalk Health Talk. I'm Dr. Freddy Gomez, and welcome back to MedTalk Health Talk, where caring is always our calling. Earlier, we discussed what mono is and what its symptoms are. Now, we discuss another infectious disease, mumps, or what we call beke. Dr. Nicole, can you briefly discuss what is mumps? What causes mumps? So, mumps is a preventable disease. It's a viral infection, and um, it, it's prominent because you also have lymph node swelling similar to mono, but this time, medyo specific siya, no, na nandito siya sa harap ng tenga. So, it's characteristic because it obstructs the angle of the jaw and the ear. So, if the ear kind of gets displaced, and you have a prominent swelling on your salivary gland area, specifically in front of the ear. What type of uh, symptoms will someone who is uh, infected with mumps have? There are symptoms similar to any viral infection, Doc Freddy. So that's fever, a headache, you could have body pain. So parang kahit common trangkaso siya eh. But what's very specific is you have lymph node swelling, particularly in front of the ear, and it kind of makes your the angle of the jaw disappear. In fact, it can be so swollen that when you press on it, it's hard to find the, the bone of the jaw. Earlier, sa infectious mono, we learned that ang age group dito who are most at risk is mga adolescents. How about mumps? Meron bang age group na mas uh, common itong mumps? For uh, mumps naman, there are specific groups that are at risk of having this. Uh, first is those uh, with immunodeficiency diseases like people receiving immunosuppressive medications, those with cancer, and those affecting the immune system. Another are the babies born to infected mothers. While it is not common, women who become infected with mumps during pregnancy can transmit the infection to their unborn uh, babies. Another is during outbreaks, especially in places uh, without enough spaces like dormitories. And lastly, and most importantly, are those uh, having not been vaccinated. Let's explain to our viewers, how is this actually passed on from someone uh, to another person? 
Mumps spread through direct contact with the saliva or respiratory droplets from the mouth, nose, or the throat. An infected person can spread the virus by uh, coughing, sneezing, or talking. Also sharing items that have saliva on them like water bottles or cups and participating in close contact activities like playing sports, dancing, or kissing. Mumps actually is not an airborne disease. An infected person can spread mumps from a few days before the salivary glands begin to swell, up to five days after the swelling begins through droplet transmission. Bacteria ba ito? Dr. Nicole, is this a virus? Is there some way that someone can be protected from mumps? This is uh, included in your MMR vaccine. So that's your measles, mumps, rubella vaccine. So if any of you have children less than two years old, you will see that your child received one MMR vaccine at the age of 12 to 15 months, and they get their second uh, shot when they're about four to six years old, so right about school age. So that's the best way to prevent it. So if you have two doses of your MMR vaccine, that's about 88% protective. But of course, we have to remember, wala pong perfect vaccine, no? so over time, bumababa din yung protective antibodies that you get from the vaccine. That's why you have a booster. How about a booster shot for adults? Is this something practical to do? Should adults who have had an MMR when they were a child, should they get boosted in order to protect themselves from one of these is mumps? Your levels of antibodies decreases over time. So I'm like you and I, we had our MMR booster right before medical school. And sometimes these are requirements prior to starting college or prior to starting work. So this is usually included in your pre-employment screening or pre-school screening. Why should we be very vigilant in trying to prevent the spread of mumps, the infection of mumps? Let's talk about some of the complications that someone with mumps may have if they contract this. There are many complications actually for moms and one of these is the uh, it may cause pain and swelling of the testicles for the males and ovaries for females that will um, actually uh, result in one week. Take note that this rarely results to infertility. Moms may also cause inflammation of the pancreas that will lead to the upper abdominal pain and as well as it can cause inflammation of the brain and its covering leading to encephalitis or meningitis posing a severe headache nausea, vomiting, and confusion. Dr. Nicole, can mumps appear to be or mistaken to be any other disease that might be common among Filipinos? It can present similarly to bacterial, uh, bacterial infection or bacterial infection of the salivary gland. So that would also cause fever, body aches, headaches, and swelling of the infected salivary gland. So it can actually be, be mistaken for that. But your doctor will help you differentiate between mumps and bacterial infection. So it can also be mistaken for other causes of viral infections that can cause swelling of the lymph nodes. But particularly bacterial sialadenitis or bacterial infection of your salivary glands. How can someone be properly diagnosed to have mumps so that the proper treatment may be started? We usually diagnose mumps based on the swollen salivary glands. A buccal swab specimen is collected within three days after the swelling of the gland. That is the preferred specimen to confirm mumps infection. This swab sample may be submitted for RT-PCR to detect the RNA of the virus. Also, a sample from your uh, saliva or a blood sample may be submitted for RT-PCR. Up next, we'll discuss how to treat as well as prevent diseases like infectious mononucleosis and mumps. MedTalk Health Talk will be right back. I'm Dr. Freddy Gomez, and this is MedTalk Health Talk, your partner in healthcare. Let's talk about a little bit about the treatment for both infectious mononucleosis as well as mumps, and what you can do in your lifestyle to try and prevent these types of diseases. I'll start first with Doc Matt. When it comes to lifestyle, we talked about some of the risk factors of uh, contracting infectious mononucleosis as well as mumps. Uh, what can people do with their overall health? Since now we know the mode of transmission of these two uh, viral diseases, we have to take, uh, put emphasis on how to prevent it. Number one is uh, if going outside, you have to wear masks, prevent from doing intimate activities with a person with unknown vaccination status. And also uh, you have at least 
healthy diet. You have to drink uh, more water. You have to balance your diet with fruits and vegetables. Dr. Nicole, I'd like to talk about vaccines a little bit with you. A lot of Filipinos now are well aware of the limitations of vaccines, what to expect, especially when it comes to boosters as well. In general, though, how should people treat vaccines, especially when it comes to vaccine-preventable diseases? In this case, for moms, no, because you could transmit the infection even before symptoms of, of, uh, of lymph node swelling. So I think what's important is you're up to date with your boosters because, of course, some parents think that once their child has had a childhood dose, then that will last them throughout their child's lifetime. So I think what's important is to keep in touch with your family doctor or your pediatrician and make sure your children, even if they're teenagers already, are up to date with their, not just the primary doses, but their boosters as well. What advice can you give those who have been diagnosed with infectious mononucleosis? or with mumps, for that matter. How should they treat that? We try to stay as healthy as possible. Sometimes it's just unavoidable. You do get exposed to somebody who is sick with these uh, infections. And I guess what's best is to keep your health up. During the pandemic, a lot of us have been trying to lose weight, mm -hmm. stay fit, stay healthy, exercise. And these are all factors that can help us get over these infections faster and prevent complications. Because it's hard to really say that, you know, there's something that will 100% prevent you from any of these illnesses. So I guess what's best is to keep your batting average of getting over these high so that staying healthy and being up to date with your shots. When it comes to the vaccine for mumps, should people be aware of any side effects that uh, your vaccine for mumps might bring? Usually, number one is the pain at the injection site. That is the most common. And um, some of the patients receiving this MMR would have a slight fever because this is a live vaccine. And also feeling of being tired. Rarely, that would cause a loss of appetite, but that, that could be a, a risk factor, but at least lightest chance. Infectious mononucleosis caused by the uh, EBV, Epstein-Barr virus. Do we have a uh, vaccine for that? Unfortunately, we don't. But what's uh, good about this is that we can identify it based on the signs and symptoms and lab tests. So that should help your doctor diagnose it correctly, even if we don't have anything to prevent it yet. And that was another insightful episode here on MedTalk Health Talk. Thank you very much, Dr. Nicole Pereiras Grande and Dr. Cesar Matthew Madria for being with us today and sharing your tips and expertise about infectious mononucleosis and mumps. I'm Dr. Freddy Gomez, and thank you for watching MedTalk Health Talk. We'll see you again next time.